wreckage of a B-29 lies strewn across a Denver suburb after crashing on the way to a safe landing. The huge tail of the superfortress towers over the scene as workmen probe the wreckage. Two engines of the plane failed as it headed for home on a routine flight, but the crew obviously believed they'd make it in safety. Eight airmen were killed, while six others miraculously escaped death. A maid in one of the houses was injured. The two and a half million dollar plane and five houses are completely demolished. Iran's British-hating Premier Mossadegh arrives in Cairo, where he gets a rousing welcome by 20,000 British-hating Egyptians. But Iranians at home charge Mossadegh was snubbed because Egypt's premier didn't show up. Nevertheless, banners hail him as the destroyer of Britain. Mossadegh goes to a meeting with Egyptian officials, which brings a crowd-pleasing declaration of mutual friendship for each other and antagonism for the British. Then Mossadegh continues homeward. The sports clothes show that President Truman is on a vacation, but official duties are no respecter of holidays. For by regular plane comes a letter pouch from Washington, chock full of work that has trailed him like a bird dog. In his office in the little White House in Key West, the president dictates to a Navy yeoman. The holiday won't last much longer because Congress returns from its own vacation January 8th, and Winston Churchill is also expected in Washington. From Korea come exceptional films of the big jump in which 3,000 GI paratroopers take part in a gigantic practice drop. The men are based in Japan, far out of range of marauding communist planes. But to make the jump realistic, they're flown to an area in Korea that approximates battle terrain. It's a test maneuver which they may be called upon to repeat in action. For a few moments, parachutes almost blot out the sky. Then the men hit the ground. Each soldier carries 55 pounds of equipment. If the Panmunjom peace talk should fail, the UN paratroopers will be ready for whatever may happen next. These five-year-old films of Archbishop Stepanat's trial are released by Tito's government simultaneously with the news that the Catholic prelate has been freed. Hidden by drawn blinds, Stepanats, accused of Nazi collaboration, arrives for his trial. In 1946, when the Archbishop was sentenced to 16 years imprisonment, Tito was Stalin's close associate. Now Yugoslavia has broken with Moscow and seeks U.S. aid and friendship while remaining communist. The prosecutor's charges were denied by Archbishop Stepanats as they are denied today. He says that the government cannot strip him of his rank of Archbishop. Still confined to his tiny village, he remains a controversial figure in the East-West struggle. In Miami Beach, swimming coach Wally Spence starts them young. Though Laura Lee Stoll can't walk yet, swimming lessons have already begun at the age of eight months. In fact, she finds it a good deal easier than walking. After all, fish don't get sore feet. It takes some coaxing to lure Donna Cooperman into the water, though she's an old-timer of 22 months. Coach Pete Desjardins sends the real veterans off the diving board, like this young lady. There's a name for this dive, but I forget it. A slogan for the next lad might be 1970 Olympics or bust. In Washington, a new kind of artificial respiration is demonstrated. Sarah Green plays the part of the person rescued from drowning as a Red Cross life-saving specialist shows how it should be done. It's called the back pressure arm lift method, and the U.S. Defense and Health Departments endorse it. The new system pulls in air by raising the arms after emptying the lungs by back pressure. It's easier to learn, and experts say it will save many more lives than the now old-fashioned Schaefer method. Warner Pathé News has a look with Look Magazine in its current issue at the 1951 All-America football team, picked by the Football Writers Association in collaboration with the man who's been the official Dream Squad selector for 27 years, Grantland Rice. As last year, two platoons were chosen. Here's the defensive platoon, capable of erecting a wall of iron before the goalposts. Here's the offensive platoon, the attacking force in this era of the football specialist. At end, Bill McCall of Stanford. At tackle, John Little of Texas A&M. At guard, Ray Beck of Georgia Tech. At center, Doug Mosley of Kentucky. At guard, Ward substituting for Liotta. 
At tackle, Don Coleman of Michigan State. At end, Stan Williams of Baylor. And now meet the men of the backfield and watch them in action. First, Dick Kazmaier of Princeton, who sent records tumbling as quarterback of a great undefeated Tiger team. Here's Kazmaier, number 42, as a passer. And here's Kazmaier as a runner. This great back has been rated with football's all-time finest. Second, John Karras of Illinois. This 175-pound backfield terror wearing number 48 is as easy to stop as a locomotive. Third, Larry Isbell of Baylor. Hailing from Houston, Texas, Isbell, number 14, gives a lesson in how to gain ground on the gridiron. Fourth, Hank Lorisella of Tennessee, a 21-year-old powerhouse from New Orleans. This is what happens when Lorisella, number 27, gets the ball. Offensively and defensively, these college players are tops in the nation. Looks All-America football team of 1951. 